respiration can be controlled voluntarily as well as involuntarily. Now its uh, neural control is a bit complex so let's try to understand it and why such complexity is required to resolve that also. So first let's try to understand involuntary neural regulation of respiration. Well involuntary neural regulation of respiration is brought about by various neural centers which are located in medulla and pons. And uh, actually these both uh, pons and medulla have uh, two, two main centers. Medulla has a dorsal respiratory group of neurons and a ventral respiratory group of neurons. Then in pons we have a pneumotaxic center and apneustic center. So let's try to see how all these centers bring about uh, respiration. Okay, first thing is initiation of respiration. So how is respiration being initiated? Well, there is a pacemaker for respiration, yes, like uh, that we have for heart. Similarly, we have a pacemaker for respiration as well. This pacemaker is a pre bodzinger complex, uh, which again is located in medulla. And this actually sets up the rhythm or pace for respiration. So how it does that? Well, this pre bodzinger complex has neurons which fire rhythmically just like the pacemaker of heart. So there is a particular rhythm for firing. Now the impulses from this pre bodzinger complex basically excite the dorsal respiratory group of neurons and uh, this dorsal respiratory group of neurons consists of what is known as inspiratory neurons and as the name suggests this inspiratory neurons basically supply the alpha motor neurons which are present in the spinal cord. So alpha motor neurons of the inspiratory muscles, right? So you see the connection pre bodzinger uh, complex in uh, rhythm, then exciting the eye neurons of uh, dorsal respiratory group, which in turn is exciting the alpha motor neurons supplying the inspiratory muscles. So obviously this is going to cause the contraction of the inspiratory muscles, hence the inspiration will be initiated. Now this inspiration should stop as well. So how that is occurring? Well, obviously for stopping the inspiration, we want the muscles to relax, isn't it? For quiet inspiration, what happens that the muscles contract and for quiet expiration, the muscles simply relax, the inspiratory muscles are relaxed and there is a quiet expiration. There is no need of contraction of the expiratory muscles. So we want these inspiratory muscles to relax. How is that going to happen? Well, as I told you that this pre bodzinger complex neurons are firing in a rhythm, isn't it? So they fire and after some time they stop firing. So by the virtue of uh, this automatic stoppage in firing of the neurons of pre bodzinger complex, there will be no excitation of eye neurons of DRG and hence the signal will not go to the inspiratory muscles. Fine. But you see, sometimes we need to increase the depth of respiration. For example, when talking, we take deep inspiration and also there is prolonged expiration. Also involuntarily also, there are various instances in which there is a change in rate and depth of respiration. For example, during exercise, fear, anxiety, then also there are certain reflexes, isn't it? So that means only the pre bodzinger complex and dorsal respiratory group of neurons that is the eye neurons are not sufficient for all that. So we have some other levels of control as well. So first is ventral respiratory group of neurons which is located in medulla. Now this ventral respiratory group of uh, neurons has two types of neurons the eye neurons that is the inspiratory neurons and there is E neurons as well that is the expiratory neurons. Now these neurons of ventral respiratory group are silent during quiet inspiration and expiration because DRG is sufficient for that. But in case of increased requirement that is increase in rate and depth of respiration, what happens that these neurons are also activated. So whenever there is increased firing of inspiratory neurons of uh, DRG, there is a spillover of that. So there is some connection between DRGI neurons and BRGI neurons. So there is a spilling over of uh, this impulse to the eye neurons of ventral respiratory group and they also start firing. So understanding that now both the eye neurons of DRG and VRG are going to cause excitation of uh, alpha motor neurons which are supplying the inspiratory muscles. So obviously they will contract with more strength 
and uh, there may be activation of some other muscles other inspiratory muscles as well depending on the requirement but when we are having increase in uh, rate and depth of respiration in that case we have a forceful expiration as well so in that case relaxation of inspiratory muscles is not sufficient what we want is that expiratory muscles should also contract so that is happening because the inspiratory neurons of vrg are connected to expiratory neurons of vrg right so i neurons inhibit the e neurons of ventral respiratory group and e neurons in turn inhibit the i neurons of ventral respiratory group so they, this is known as mutual inhibition right so they are connected by mutual inhibition fine but uh, still you see that here uh, till now uh, the expiration has not started isn't it we are just telling that there is some mutual inhibition here and uh, we have uh, discussed that how increase in uh, depth of inspiration is going to occur not how expiration has started because it may be that we need to increase the rate of respiration as well isn't it so the rhythm of pre wurzinger complex is not being followed here so there should be some other connections as well yes there are other connections which cause the switching of inspiration to expiration depending on requirement and that is the connection from the pons so the pneumotaxic center which we spoke about this pneumotaxic center actually inhibits drg so if drg is inhibited what will be its importance physiologically when well, you see that there will be no more activation of the inspiratory muscles and hence it is causing a switch to expiration so two things we have got so that a switch can occur just because of the inbuilt rhythm of pre wurzinger complex that is during a quiet inspiration and expiration but sometimes when that switch needs to be changed also so another level of control is there that is the pneumotaxic center inhibiting drg and causing a switch to expiration but there is another center we spoke about that is the apneustic center this apneustic center actually excites the dorsal respiratory group i neurons so pneumotaxic center inhibiting drg and apneustic center exciting uh, drg so, see this is very important because of the fine balance between the inhibition and excitation of drg the switch from inspiration to expiration is smooth and it's not like a abrupt switch to expiration so in summary we can say that pneumotaxic center acts as a switch for expiration to occur also one thing you note here that since it limits duration of inspiration obviously it will cause increase in rate of respiration see increased depth is taken care by simultaneous activation of i neurons of ventral respiratory group right so early switch will not that much matter so that's how that increase in rate and depth of respiration is brought about when required but who will activate pneumotaxic center well there is a negative feedback mechanism also operating see there are stretch receptors which are present in tracheobronchial tree so when there is lung inflation there is a stretch and these uh, stretch receptors are stimulated which sends afferents via vagus nerve from a stretch receptor to this pneumotaxic center causing its activation so this vagus nerve is actually inhibiting the i neurons via the pneumotaxic center that means more inflation will cause a stopping of inspiration and switch to expiration this is also the mechanism of herring brewer reflex that is uh, lung inflation when it goes above 1 liters then it initiates lung expiration so i hope you have understood that how it is happening lung inflation causing the stimulation of the stretch receptors activation of the vagus and then inhibition of the i neurons so there is a kind of negative feedback operating here so we have developed our flow chart for the neural control of uh, respiration uh, just uh, before going further just if you see here that we have spoken about the switch and uh, here we spoke about that how i neurons are mutually inhibiting the e neurons in uh, vrg isn't it so this is because that when i neurons are active we don't want e neurons to be active and uh, with the inhibition of the i neurons of drg what is going to happen that these i neurons of vrg will also stop firing and hence the inhibition from the e neurons will be removed and uh, e neurons will become active 
then they are going to stimulate the alpha motor neurons which are supplying the expiratory muscle. So that is going to cause the deep expiration as well. Fine. So this is a flow chart for involuntary neural control of respiration. What about voluntary control? Well, it will be from the cerebral cortex. So from the corticospinal tract, there is information going to the alpha motor neurons of the inspiratory muscles and expiratory muscles which is going to control this voluntarily. Now apart from the control via these uh, neural centers, you might be aware that there are certain protective reflexes as well. There is cuff reflex, sneeze reflex and J reflex. The cuff and sneeze reflex occur because of the presence of irritant receptors in larynx, trachea and bronchi. And uh, whenever there is some irritant, uh, there is a stimulation of these irritant receptors and uh, there is again the vagal afferents which go from uh, these to the neural centers and this results in bronchoconstriction, hyperapnea and cough. So that is the cough reflex and the sneeze reflex obviously you know that uh, because of these irritant receptors just to throw out the irritant from the body there is a sneeze. Then what about J reflex? Well, J receptors are present in interstitium in between the alveoli and the blood vessels. So here J receptors are present and what happens that if there is a stretch in interstitium then these J receptors are stimulated. So when there will be a stretch in the interstitium? See, when there is increase in pulmonary hydrostatic pressure what happens that uh, with the hydrostatic pressure rise there might be leakage of some fluid into the this uh, pulmonary interstitium and this is going to increase the stretch in the interstitium. Now this rise in pulmonary hydrostatic pressure can occur in case of uh, when we go to very high altitudes or in case of severe exercise because the cardiac output is increasing so more blood is flowing through the pulmonary vessels which causes increase in pulmonary hydrostatic pressure. Right, so high altitude and exercise, these J reflexes is stimulated. So what happens because of the increase in the stretch, these J receptors are stimulated and the end result is apnea, bradycardia, hypotension and inhibition of stretch reflex. So obviously you might have understood the physiological significance of a person is exercising too much. Right, so inhibition of stretch reflex, uh, bradycardia, hypotension will not allow him to continue the exercise any further. So yes, this is also a protective reflex. With this, now let's try to solve the very famous question of uh, lesions at various levels in brain stem that how it is going to affect the respiration. Well, you see, if a lesion is above pons, say here, what will be the effect? See, basically voluntary control will be lost because it is coming from the motor cortex but involuntary control will be normal since none of the centers of respiration are affected. So let's draw it. Say suppose this re represents a normal inspiration and expiration and uh, let us see two ways. One that if vagus is intact and another one in which vagus is cut. So if vagus is intact, we will get a normal inspiration and expiration and in case if the vagus is cut, what is going to happen? The feedback control is going to be lost, isn't it? So switching to expiration is being delayed. Basically rate of respiration is going to decrease and depth of respiration is going to increase because the switch to inspiration is not happening. Okay, next level, suppose the lesion is between pneumotaxic center and apneustic center. What will happen? Well now obviously the pneumotaxic center will not be able to inhibit uh, DRG but apneustic center is still active. So what is going to happen? The depth of respiration will increase too much right and this is known as apneusis. So it's like a gasping too much depth of respiration while rate of respiration is much less. And what will happen if vagus is cut? Well it will be too much aggravated isn't it because switching to expiration is being prevented. So further there will be increase in depth and decrease in rate of respiration. Now third if the lesion is between pons and medulla then what is going to happen? We will see some pattern of respiration that coming from the pre bodzinger complex but uh, it is not fine tuned. So the fine tuned respiration which we get because of the action of so many centers that will be missing. 
And what about if vagus is cut? Well, some pattern will be there, but the depth of respiration will be more. And finally, the fourth lesion that is below the medulla, what is going to happen? Obviously, all the centers are cut off, so no information is going to the alpha motor neurons of inspiratory muscles or expiratory muscles and hence there will be complete stoppage of respiration that is apnea. So that's all for the neural regulation of uh, respiration. I hope you understood that what is the physiological significance of so many centers and how it helps us in uh, changing the respiration according to the needs of the body involuntarily as well as voluntarily. Well, thanks for watching the video. If you liked it, do press the like button, share the video with others and don't forget to subscribe to the channel Physiology Open. Thank you.